Hello and welcome to Le Mans 1988. This is probably the most important Le Mans that has taken place for a very long time, going back into the 50s perhaps to find anything as important as this. You join us as the cars are out on this famous circuit on their warming up lab. I'm Neville Hay. I'm joined here by Anthony Marsh to follow the action throughout this 24-hour race. Anthony, any prospects in your mind for this one? It is Jaguar's great ambition to come back and win again first time as we know since 1957 they failed to do it last year although they won the championship through the year they failed to win the race so this is their big battle five Jaguars against three works Porsches and a host of private ones as well cars now of course on the parade lap before the Indianapolis type rolling start the old Le Mans start with the drivers sprinting across the track to their cars that's a thing of the past so they follow this pace car around if all is well it'll pull off and the green light will go and they're on for 24 hours. Yes, the reason why it's a thing of the past, of course, is that nowadays drivers are strapped into the cars. They did try it with the co-driver running across the road and uh, then starting off the number one driver in the car, but it didn't work that way. And we've already got somebody in trouble there. Yes, I think that's the ADA, one of the C2 cars. Well, we're coming up now towards the start, towards that last corner, the three Porsches in red and yellow, the fastest cars in practice because, of course, they're turbocharged, they can turn up the boost, which means in practice they can go quicker, and Porsche always like to be fastest in practice. But the important thing is not who's fastest in practice, it's who wins the race. Three works Porsches versus five Jaguars, and the winner of the 1988 Le Mans is 24 hours ahead of us. As we come up to this last corner, you'll see the pace car pull off, off to the right up the pit road and then the race will be on and it's usually exactly at four o'clock today this year it's a bit earlier it's three o'clock because of the french elections off goes the pace car 24 hours from now we'll know who's won the race anthony indeed the three jet and three porsches of course were fastest in qualifying hans stuck did one of his flyers to take pole this shouldn't be a disappointment to anybody because, as you said, they can turn the boost up in qualifying. They can't do it in the race because they'll run out of fuel. And the three Jaguars there behind the three Porsches. There are, of course, five Jaguars altogether, two of them over from America with Danny Sullivan, Davy Jones and Price Cobb. And then the other one, Kevin Cogan, the Irishman uh, Daly and the Australian Perkins. Three Porsches still in line ahead on the first lap. And it's Wallach, number 18 in front, not Stuck, the pole man. You know, this is a big surprise because I think Stuck is going to want to reverse that situation. He will want to set the pace for the Porsche team. The interesting thing is, who's going to set the pace for the Jaguar team? I don't think it's going to be the Martin Brundle car. I would suspect he'll want to hand back, so it may very well be that Jan Lammers, the Flying Dutchman, will do that job in number two Jaguar. Of course, the difference between that and the other Jaguar, Brundle and Nielsen elected to run with only two drivers. The, all the other Jaguars have got three drivers apiece. Lammers, of course, is with Johnny Dumfries and Andy Wallace. Yes, the important thing to remember, however, is that Brundle will probably drive second and take over the best-placed car. If that car is well up, then he'll take it over. If the other car is well up, he might take that over. Once he's committed himself, however, he can't score points on the other car. We're in car now with John Watson in one of the Jaguars down the straight where the cars reach roughly 245, 250 miles an hour. And here are the Porsches and the Jaguar already among them. Yes, Lammers moving into third place, I think, splitting the Porsche team already. There he is. Wallach and Stuck ahead of him. The Andretti's behind him. And then his teammate, the number one car of Nielsen and Bruntel. Now, it's interesting also to keep an eye out for that other Jaguar there. That's the uh, number 22 car, the comparatively slow car in practice, but they're all up there in the first 10 or so, so obviously nobody's going to lie back too far. No, of course, they're very much part of a team. The Americans have come over from the American racing team of the TWR Jaguar team. Look at Lammers, he's now in second place, Neville. Yes, Lammers up to second place. I think of the Americans, the man to watch out for is Danny Sullivan. I don't think he's driven at Le Mans before, but he's driven in Europe before, and he's very, very quick still and very ambitious. And it's Stuck now in the lead. Stuck, number 17, has taken the lead with Lammers in the number two Jaguar second. Then the Porsches in third and fourth places. The Andretti car, driven by uh, Mario Andretti, his son, Mike Andretti, and John Andretti, who is, of course, uh, the cousin of Michael, the nephew of uh, Mario Andretti, who was a world champion at one time in Formula One and has won so many races in America, it isn't true. He wants to do the one thing that the only other driver has done is Graham Hill. He'd like to do Indianapolis, Le Mans, and, of course, Monaco. 
that he's had a long ambition to do Le Mans with his family, with his son originally, and now of course he's got the nephew there as well. The dearly held ambition of this great driver from the States, Mario Andretti. In car, once again, as the Porsche comes out in the lead, and it's Porsche first, Jaguar second, Porsche third and fourth, then another Jaguar. The three works Porsches are running with a slightly different type of engine management system. What's that, you might ask? Well, in fact, it's what you and I have, fuel injection, this sort of thing, and the electrics of the engine are all computer controlled, and that's giving them an edge over the privately owned. Porsches because only the works Porsches have got that and they reckon it's made up an enormous difference between the cars. The works Porsches are easy to spot with their bright red and yellow uniform. The Jaguars basically white but with quite a pattern on them and different coloured screen bands for the different crews. Oh, the Jaguars well up, Anthony, at the moment. He's in the lead now. Lamas yes. has taken the lead now. No, he has not. No, no, he's not in the lead. We've still got that one Porsche who's pulled out, in fact, about 50 yards or so, but I don't think he's going to let him get too far ahead. That's the uh, fourth place car, the number 19, the Andretti car. Number 17, Stuck leading, drawing away a bit from Lammers and Wallach. Yes, but Wallach, brilliant Bob, as he's known, 45 years old, ex-skier who took up motor racing quite a long time ago, but very much a sports car specialist, and the leading man, Hans Stuck, Back inside with John Watson again, you'll just see that Armco flash by. It's now three-tier Armco following that huge accident that one of the Jaguars had last year when driven by Wynne Percy, which he walked away from. Testament to the strength of the car. Lammers is quite under pressure now from Bullock, the third-place Porsche, pushing the second-place Jaguar as Stuck in the lead pulls out. Significant, I think, that the Jaguars can stay with the Porsches as we predicted in straight line speed during the race itself. It's a very different matter to what happens during the course of practice. Of course, the fun and game starts with the pit stops roughly every 40 minutes. They change tyres, they mostly change drivers. Every two or three or four stops, they have to change brake pads and they have to refuel. The old days of hot timed pit stops have rather gone because they are only limited to 60 litres a minute flow for safety reasons. So if they, the tanks are allowed to be 100 litres capacity, say they've got 90 litres left, they're going to be a minute and a half in the pits, whatever else happens. Yes, it does make, in fact, for uh, interesting pit work still, but it's not quite the panic that you sometimes used to see when the cars were filled under pressure and the car was in for a very short time. But it does mean you've got more time to make sure everything else is OK, settle the driver in and the other driver fasten his safety belts and so on. Now, it's quite significant on the twisty bit, you'll see that Jan Lammers and the Porsche behind him in third place pull up a little bit on the leader. And that seems to me where the Jaguar has quite a significant advantage. The aerodynamics are superb on these Jaguars. Seven litre V12 engine, uh, two valves per cylinder as opposed to four valves per cylinder, which they have experimented with. But, of course, they've got huge torque, and there isn't, in race form, a great deal of difference between the two. The big disadvantage with the Jaguar engine, it is a tall engine, it's a heavy engine, and the car, in fact, to get down to the lightweight that they have now has taken a lot of hard work. Of course, they are two opposite approaches to the rules. The rules are simply based on minimum weight and maximum fuel allowance. The Porsches have the comparatively small, very high-revving, heavily turbocharged engine, the Jaguars have the big 7-litre atmospheric non-turbo engine. Two different approaches to the same rules, which is what this formula was designed to create. And it should give some advantage in this long race on fuel consumption to the Jaguars. But, as you said, Neville, the new electronic engine management system, which controls the performance of the engine and the fuel use, might just level that out on the well, Porsches. Yeah, Derek Bell was heard to say that he thought it was going to. In fact, he thought the Porsche would be very, very competitive. Uh, we've got a pit caller here. That's Ray Bellum, by the look of it, the C2 leader in the championship in the Spice. Yes, that's Gordon Spice's teammate, of course, Gordon Spice, who's won the C2 championship. C2 is simply uh, a, a limited, uh, a smaller weight limit and a small limit to what size of engine you get. But, of course, if you put in a great big aero engine, it'll eat all the fuel of the first few laps. So the fuel limit and the weight dictates what you can do. These are mostly running a three-litre-plus modified versions of the old Cosworth Formula One engine. There goes Belm out of the pits after his pit stop. A very early pit stop. You don't really need that. No, it's not significant in a 24-hour race, but it's uh, a funny way to start it and something that no driver likes to do. So still the same position, still in the lead. 
the Hanstock car, which of course he's sharing with Britain's Derek Bell, and also with another very, very powerful force in the shape of another of the German drivers who really has won Le Mans now, I think it two, three times, Klaus Ludwig. Careful, Klaus. Bullock is pressing Lammers very hard indeed. I think the interesting thing about this teaming of these three Porsche drivers is that Stuck and Klaus Ludwig probably, in fact, vie for the position who is the quickest German around. That's right. But you notice also, so early in the race, already they're lapping the slower cars. This is one of the great difficulties for more, is the speed differential between cars that will do 250 miles an hour on the straight and proportionally round the circuit, and the C2 cars, and there are also some IMSA cars, another uh, grade really from America, which are a good deal slower. This is one of the great difficulties, particularly if it should rain or get misty during the night. That was a shot of John Watson again. Now yeah. still in second place. And they've all closed up. Something must have got in their way. They've all closed up again, the three of them. It looks to me as if the gap indeed may very well have closed, Anthony. And the Jaguars in front, I think. Lammers has taken the leading Porsche. That means Volek is still in third place, but Stuckey is now second. This is really the Le Mans Grand Prix tradition, isn't it? It really is. Jaguar in the lead. It's a hark back to the days of Jaguar and Mercedes when they fought it out in the first hour or so. And we're seeing exactly the same thing now with the Porsches crawling all over that Jaguar. They're not going to have, let him have it easily. Stuck in second place, a real fighter if ever there was one. And the Andretti Porsche is fourth, so the Jaguar was rather on his own at the moment, with the whole seething mob from Stuttgart on his tail. Yes, significantly the other Jaguars have not been able to back up this car. We don't know why yet. When we get the first pit stops, we may learn whether or not every car is handling perfectly etc sometimes a car that handled well in practice doesn't on race day and for no reason anybody can think of but it looks to me as if very much the hair of the jaguar team and significantly quicker than any other jaguar as a number two car i think jan was possibly helped by lapping slower cars we saw them all bunched together very close and then we saw them down the further down the course with the Jaguar in front and I think as often happens the sort of Lapery lottery may have come out his way this time. Yes he's a pretty uncompromising character when it comes to Lapery and things like that. The Porsches fighting down among themselves behind him. of course that's exactly what Jaguar want. The harder they fight each other the more easily it will be for him to make a break. And this is the one thing the Jaguars are not doing, as far as we can see, is racing amongst themselves. They're letting Jan Lammers dictate the pace. Yes, looking back down the field, as I rather predicted, the one Jaguar that we've got to keep an eye out for is the number 21 car, the Danny Sullivan car. That is travelling very, very quickly indeed, and is in up and among the Coventry cars as opposed to the American cars. Well, Danny Sullivan, as you say, of course, an Indianapolis winner and a real charger in any kind of racing, and his teammates they're a good team uh, the, um, the Irishman of course Daly no sorry it's David Jones and Price Cobb the other Americans David Jones is very young he's had experience in Formula 3 but he's not what you would call a very experienced driver Price Cobb has had a lot of racing in all sorts of different categories they're a very hot team that Yes, David Jones, the baby of the team, in fact, at 23 years old. And here you see the Porsches charging after the Jaguar down the Mulsanne Strait, 312 kilometers per hour. Would you like to do the arithmetic? I think you'll find it goes higher than that as they get a bit further down the Strait. 366 we've got. And that is quick by anybody's standards. And the flag there to signify as if uh, nobody knew that somebody was coming up on a slower car there, but it's the slower car that needs the warning, and that's always the bugbear of Le Mans. More so, perhaps, in the hours of dawn and dusk than it is in bright daylight like this, bright sunlight like this. But nevertheless, the Jaguar, you will see, has got his lights on to warm the traffic that he is approaching, and uh, obviously doesn't want to be held up. The blue flag waved means there's a faster car behind you, and you should give way. And the drivers of these huge 250 mile an hour monsters fighting it out for the lead here are very much dependent on the good sense and safety sense and manners of the drivers of the slower cars. Because yes. if they don't get out of the way, it could be extremely difficult. 
this battle is to look at this. This is still three cars, and the Jaguar comes in the pits. First pit stop for Jan Lammers, number two, Jaguar. Yes, the Jaguars at the top end of the pits there, so they haven't got too far to travel when they come in, but they've got an awfully long way to go when they come out. And you can see the huge crowd as the refueling goes on. That's not a driver with a helmet on. That's one of the pit crew with a helmet on. There's a driver change taking place, though. Johnny Dumfries taking over from Lammers, and these Porsches still seem to be fighting amongst themselves. Stock wants to get back in front of Wallach. I really can't understand the team logic of that, but they're all very experienced professional people. I'm sure they know what they're doing. Well, I was talking, in fact, to the team before the race, Anthony, and it does seem that the Porsche drivers are more or less being allowed to drive their own race, which is all very well, but uh, if it happens at an early stage like this, it can result in problems. Well, again, they'll be having to watch their fuel gauge. If they, they'll be getting a bit of a deficit now, they'll have to make it up later. Of course, they take a bit of a gamble on things like a yellow flag period, where everybody has to slow back if there's an accident. That kind of thing, which may... It's a gamble. It means you ease off on fuel a bit. But if you drive flat out like this for 24 hours, you're going to have some problems. Yes, every other Le Mans, since there's been a pace car situation, as two Porsches come in, has had a pace car out. It slowed the pace of the race, but it's not happened yet here, and it may not happen, so they might lose out on that. Two coming in together. That's going to tax the resources of the team. I wonder if that's planned. Wolleck stops in number 18, ready for a driver change, and the other one comes across his bars and pulls it in front of him. It shows Supposing that they're a bit Volek's marginal on uh, fuel, Anthony. Supposing Volek's ready to go out first. I hate to criticise, and I'm sure I'm wrong, but this looks a bit of a muddle to me, Neville. Yes, it was a bit odd to have two cars in at the same time that early. And the second one in front. Yeah, I think the Andretti car came in on its own, did it not, a little bit earlier on? I believe it did. This must be because one of them is a lap early, I should think. It's got to be. Meanwhile, now. soldiering on, having had a pit stop, refueled, new driver, in the lead now is Johnny Dumfries in the number two Jaguar. Yes, now the interesting point here is going to be, very significant, I think, is how the pit stops actually went, because if the Jaguar took on less fuel, he should theoretically come out with a lead. Yes, it's going to be to and fro all the time. These cars running so close together when they're on the track, that uh, a fuel stop's worth is going to be made up as you come out, unless, as you say, your stop is longer than the other jet. So Johnny Dumfries now at the wheel of the leading Jaguar, 28 years old, ex-British Formula 3 champion, uh, Formula 1 drive with Lotus, and then, sadly, nothing on the Formula 1 front, but last year drove for Mercedes here and holds the current lap record at Le Mans. Yes, I should think that lap record will probably go today. There goes Stuck out. I think he's got out first, possibly. Yes, and I think, in fact, that may very well be Klaus Ludwig that's taken over. Yes. I think they changed drivers there. Yep, it would be Klaus Ludwig second in that car, that's right. That's one of the Japanese team cars. Yes, this was interesting. Uh, the Japanese have often made their bid here at Le Mans, but they've never really uh, come home with um, any money in the bank, so to speak. And the big problem with the Toyota team, for example, is that they're very, very quick in practice because they can turn the boost up, but in the race, they're very, very slow. Well, I think they virtually know that they cannot get through the race on the fuel allowance at anything like a competitive speed. I think it's as pessimistic as that. Well, here we see the battle. There's the Jaguar. There's the Porsche. The pit stops are over. The first round of pit stops are over. And we're back more or less where we started. They're not far behind, are they? And, of course, the traffic now is very heavy. The lapping is a problem. He's, you see, uh, Dumfries has got a slower car between him and Ludwig, which will be to Ludwig's disadvantage until he get on a straight and take it. There he goes, but he lost a few seconds there. Yes, Klaus Ludwig, 38, 39 years old now, has driven extensively in America, drove for Zach Speed in saloons, has driven for Ford, and, in fact, he's still driving for Ford in the European Touring Car Championship, a very quick driver and one of the very best sorters of cars. And here at Le Mans, he actually had two victories on the trot. He was going for his hat trick and decided that uh, the car wasn't happy, he retired from a race here, and said he wouldn't come back to Le Mans after a big accident here a couple of three years ago. But when he saw the changes to the circuit, he changed his mind, and uh, it's welcome back, careful Klaus. Well, he's certainly in a very competitive situation at the moment. Closing on Dumfries. Dumfries is quite capable of taking care of himself out there, but he will probably have set his mind to lap at a specific time. And if Klaus wants to go out and charge, well, 
That's up to class to a degree. That's a Jaguar. That's a Jaguar that has spun. It looks to me as if that's the number one car. And John Nielsen, I think, at the wheel of that. Yes, uh, he's got well into the sand. Whether he's actually hit anything, it's difficult to tell. I think possibly he hasn't, but he's stuck in the protective gravel, which is designed to slow you down so you don't hit anything. Well, he's well and truly stuck there, and uh, the marshals are rushing to his aid now. Losing the... time, losing time. This is what you don't need at this stage. No, the regulation's very clear, though, because that car is where it is. It can have assistance to move. If it was somewhere safer, then it'd be up to the driver to restart it. But as it's where it is, and it's in the uh, kitty litter there, then they will actually pull it clear so it's not in a dangerous position. And hopefully, if it hasn't hit anything, he'll be able to restart. Yes, yeah, so he's, he's well off the track, but he's not off to where the next accident might happen because somebody else could come off at the same place. So that is why, as you say, it's this is this dangerous place. Look at this fight for the lead. Ludwig right up with Dumfries. And meanwhile, I don't believe that. Oh, I think they had that at the first Le Mans, didn't they? I don't believe... What a lovely thing. It's amazing. It's a sort of lumber wagon. Yeah. It's been they're there going for to years. pull it out with that. Well, they obviously. are, too. They are. What a lovely machine. A thrill for the driver sitting there watching the cars go by. He's yes. got a grandstand seat. And now, of course, he's facing the wrong way. So somehow or other, safely, he's got to turn around and come back in the direction of the race as they rather leisurely unhook him. And then, of course, he's got to decide whether to go in the pits to see if there's any damage or if he's picked up any gravel which might upset the cooling system or anything of that sort. John Nielsen, the Danish driver of the Jaguar, unusual for him to make a mistake. Yes, we should tell you, as if you didn't know probably, that the man who runs the Jaguar team has been responsible for the Jaguar effort here at Le Mans. They've come back into sports car racing, they're winning the European Touring Car Championship. It's Tom Walkinshaw. Mm -hmm. Tom Walkinshaw is a tough, hard Scotsman, and I wouldn't want to face Tom Walkinshaw after I'd done that to one of his cars. Well, let's hope he doesn't have to face him. If the car's not damaged, he can go straight on anyway, and they're sweeping up the general mess that he's created. There's the camera again in the number three Jaguar, showing us just what it's like for a driver. Look how smooth and steady that car is. No bumps, no vibration. It's like a saloon car on the motorway. Yes, that was on the Mulsanne straight. And you know when they put that surface down, they laid it with lasers, Anthony, so it's so smooth. And in fact, it was so smooth that it actually affected a lot of people uh, when they came to set the cars up. Now, John Nielsen has not stopped. He's gone straight by. So the curiosity of his teammate Martin Brundle as to whether the car is damaged or not and where he's been and why will not be satisfied for the moment except on any radio communication he has time to make. Yes, he probably by now has had a chance to assess that there's no damage and he'd rather stay out there and get on with the job than have another stop for no apparent reason if it is okay. Interesting point, of course, the pit signal, although they have radio communication, the pit signals, of course, are not given from the pits. They're given from a special signaling area right down the other end of the track after Mulsan, uh, which is controlled by radio from the pits. This battle for the lead is still hot. This is like Ludwig is not going to let Dumfries get away, and Dumfries, who's not enormously experienced in this kind of racing here, is really putting on a fight and holding him off. Yes, Johnny Dumfries' first drive for the team was at Spa at the end of last year when he significantly dented a car. Um, but having got it undented, so to speak, the Jaguars went on to win that race and clinch not just the drivers but the manufacturers' championship all at the same time. Well, he's holding off one of the toughest drivers in the business, Klaus Ludwig. Look, there's nothing between them. Nothing between them. And he's coming alongside and he's taking him. He's turned up the wick on the turbo and taken the lead. Ludwig now leads for Porsche with Dumfries second for Jaguar. But again, no panic, I would have thought, because again, they can't go on like that and not run out of fuel if they keep on driving at that sort of rate. Klaus Ludwig then in the lead, joining Dumfries in second place. Jaguars running well up behind him, but it's still, in fact, Porsche first, Jaguar second, and then the other two works Porsches, currently at the moment the top quartet. Little bit of a gap opening out. Again, you see, we don't know what the team tactics are, just as this number two Jaguar may be, in fact, designated the lead car, so the number 17 Porsche may be designated the Jaguar breaker. 
Well, either way, they're very evenly matched as they come down the Molsan this time, and uh, he's getting ready to go again. Then we go back to the camera inside the number three car, and he did go, he took him. Yeah, just as in fact we went to the end car camera, uh, past went the Jaguar again into the lead. <laughs> So he's got him back in the lead again. Now there's that pit signaling area that Anthony was talking about a moment or two ago, and here we see that move. We've gone back to it, or have we? That was something flying off another car. It's the back of a car flies off. Now we had that happen last year, and of course when that does happen, it's very, very serious indeed, because all the aerodynamics go on the car. Fortunately, it's gone well clear of the track, right over the other side, so that particular tail section of something has not done anybody any harm. There's the car that lost it. It looks like a C2 car. Yes, it is a C2 car. And what's this? It's the Porsche. The this Porsche is, is slowing. It's Lars Ludwig. Do you think it could be have anything done. to do with the fact that he was going so hard and using so much fuel? I think you might have read that right. I think that, in fact, we could have a situation where Ludwig has stayed out perhaps one lap too many, and he may very well be out of fuel. Now, it's absolutely critical that he gets that car back to the pits, because if he doesn't, that's it. There will be a Porsche out. But he meanwhile, can, it's losing a lot of time. He can coast on the downhill bits and possibly drive it on the starter motor while the battery lasts on the other bits. But I think, as you say, I think he's done one lap too many, all gone a bit too hard, one or the other. He's a small pocket-sized battleship, but you know, Hans Stoke and Derek Bell are very much bigger chaps, and I wouldn't want to be telling them about it, not even <laughs> over the radio. <laughs> yes. This is losing a lot of valuable time. He's made the pits, at least. He's made the pits. Now, at this stage, again, I think he'll be allowed to have assistance to reach the pit, because they don't want a car stuck in an awkward place. So I think on safety grounds, if no other, there they go the Porsche mechanics in overalls to match the car and one of them hurriedly talking to Klaus and asking him what's the problem and he says fuel no fuel and well, whatever the German fuel is I can't remember at the moment I can't know benzene isn't it benzene or something of the sort whatever it is uh, he's not going to be a very popular man well, now, that, of course, means that the lead Jaguar will pull away because the other Porsches were nothing like so close to it. This was the one that was biting the Jaguar's ankles. If Jaguars have ankles, I suppose they must do. And so it's pulling away now and building a nice big cushion. Because from a Jaguar point of view, it's the right Porsche that has overrun this fuel problem. Now, I couldn't see whether they changed drivers there or not. Did no, you I'm see sure that? they didn't. I don't no, think, I don't they, think did. they did. They wouldn't be uh, because it would be... Uh, possibly out of schedule. Yeah, so Klaus Ludwig staying at the wheel. And now he's got a lot of ground to pick up, and that car is going to have to be driven with, should we say, one eye on the fuel gauge, certainly, but it's going to be absolutely flat out from here on in. I think it's also got to be one eye on the laps. I think that uh, he's got to make sure he comes in right. And I think because he came in so late, they've left the driver. Now, there's one of the Jaguar drivers getting ready to take over. And that looks to me like Andy Wallace. A first-timer at Le Mans. Yeah, first-timer at Le Mans. It's only his second drive for the team. Perhaps the least experienced and of the British drivers. And here's the car he's waiting for. Johnny Dumfries brings the number two leader in. Now, the Porsches are probably close enough to take the lead back while he's in the pits, I would think. Not that number 17 one, but the 18 Porsche which with um, Van Schuppen, Australian, Van der Merwe, South African, and Bob Wollek, Frenchman. You see, they have different seats in the car because of the size of drivers. It isn't like getting into yours and my car where you can alter the seats. You actually have the seat molded to you, and you have a basic seat. You clip in your cushion, and it uh, fits where it touches, so to speak. Well, Wallace is a good deal shorter than the priest, for one thing. Now, that's the leader, then. That's the number 18 Porsche, which, will, which is in the lead now. So that's the Bob Wallach, Saral van der Merve, and uh, Vern Schuppen. Vern Schuppen, an Australian driver, who significantly has two cars in the race, which uh, are entered by Vern Schuppen, and there are two other Porsches, while he drives the works cars. That's right. He runs his own private team. Now, I think I saw the number 21, the American Jaguar, Sullivan Jones Cobb there, close behind the leading car. Highly likely that we did, because that car has been running very well up, and indeed, he is now on my guesstimation in fourth place, but we'll check that out for you in a moment or two. 
as is that leader making for the pits? Yes, the Porsche's going in. This is the leading car coming into the pit. So Number 18, Porsche. So he will lose the lead now while he's in, I would think, and the Jaguar would probably go back in again. Andy Wallace should have the honor of leading Le Mans because uh, the other Porsche's a bit further back, and of course the number 17 Porsche, the original leader, lost all that time with that delayed fuel stop. And that's the Japanese Nissan, the uh, Hashino Suzuki Bada car. They have wonderful names, these Japanese, don't they? I expect they think ours are funny, too. Well, they probably do. Here's the Jaguar weaving his way in and out of the traffic, and this, of course, is so often the secret when the racing is close at the moment. However, any traffic that he passes, it's got to be done by the Porsche. There goes the number 18 out of the ports, and there's an out of the pits, and there's another Porsche now carrying that number two. Yes, the Porsches are keeping the pressure on, aren't they? Either way, they just keep that pressure on all the time. It's a bit like when you talk about the game going with service in tennis. It goes with pit stops. You can see how hard these cars are suspended. There's very, very little suspension movement on a modern sports racing car, or for that matter, Grand Prix car. And the reason is, of course, that they've got these huge wide tires, and they want to keep them absolutely flat to the road. That's the number 19 car. That's the Andretti Porsche. That looks like a scheduled stop. I don't think there are any problems there for them. There's headlights on, as we said, to warm the slower traffic. It's one easy way to pick up that there's a faster car coming up. And somebody spun that one. That's the 22 Jaguar, Kevin Cogan, Derek Daly from Ireland, Larry Perkins from Australia. That's doing a three-point turn after a spin. Didn't hit anything, didn't even go off by the look of it. No, that's the, 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 the back Jaguar, the last of the five cars, and that's being driven, obviously, very, very steadily indeed. Larry Perkins, the only one with any Le Mans experience of any significance there. Derek Daly, I don't think, has done it before. It's the first time we've seen Derek in Europe for a long time. Kevin Cogan, however, a uh, very capable man. Yes, um, surprising that for that car to spin like that. Of course, you never know. We didn't see the beginning of it. There could be a slower car that forced him to do that. These things happen. There's two Jaguars, the 21, the American one, and number one, the Brundle Nielsen one. There's the leader. And that, I think, is the battle for the lead all over again. Yeah. Looks like it to me. That's Andy Wallace. And closing in on Andy Wallace now, the Porsche after its pit stop. And let's see whether Andy Wallace gives the Porsches as much trouble as the other two drivers in that same car did. I think that's probably Cyril van der Merwe, the uh, South African in the number 18 Porsche now in second place. He's really having a go at Wallace. 42 years old, van der Merwe drives sports cars and drives them very well and is driving this one back into the lead Abs on the 1988 Le Mans 24 Absolutely wheel to wheel down the straight. Yes, he has got him. For a minute I thought Wallace was going to hold him off, but he's now right in slipstream. He's going to come and do him back again. It's almost it's like the first years of disc brakes where the Jaguars at the end of the straight seem to have the advantage, don't they? He's done it. Look, he's got him back. On the same straight, on the one run. Yes, do you remember the Jaguars when they first had disc brakes? They used to glow in the night. Yes. Before they learned how to keep them cool. Well, now, of course, they make them out of um, carbon material and things like that, so they equally glow now, in fact, you can see them. But, but it's an example of how racing improves the automotive engineering product for the street. Oh, yes, because it's played its huge part in Le Mans, as we'll no doubt have time to talk about, with virtually every part that breaks, of course, very significant, and engine management systems and... Fuel injection years ago. Yeah, and, of course, equally important, just the plain metallurgy. Is this going on again? Well, the this Porsche goes back in the lead again. This is supposed to be a 24-hour race. Well, they can be very, very proud back home of Andy Wallace in his debut race at Le Mans here, fighting it out with Porsche in his first stint in the car and getting himself caught up a bit more with the back marker, I think, perhaps, than uh, Van der Merwe did Yes, then. he was a little bit unlucky in the lapping there. Well, you can see why they use those headlights, uh, because it all happened so quickly. You see, one says how strange to drive so fast at this stage of a 24-hour race, but if anybody does, you've got to. You can't afford to let them get away out of sight, so you've got to keep it up. Yes, you can't lay it far back and hope that the pace will slow because there's always the chance, as has happened so many times, where the car that goes out and sets the pace is the car that lasts. And, of course, both these teams have got big backup. Ooh, that doesn't look very nice. That looks like uh, a car that's jumped the barrier and caught fire, number 30. 
That's one of the Cougars, isn't it? Yes, that's the Courage Cougar, the Francois Amigo uh, Belmondo car, and Yoshi Katayama, the uh, Japanese driver. And there's another one off there. That's number 37, which is one, one of, of the, the Toyotas. Yeah, that's the British, uh, at least one British driver in among them there. Looks like uh, he's spinning his wheels in the dirt. He can't get it going. Yes, Tiffany Dell's one of the crew of that. Yes, tough noodle, as he's known to one or two of his uh, <laughs> friends. Very in experienced in a very wide range of racing and also broadcasting, Tiffany Dell. Yeah, he's in an awkward place there because if he backs off, it's going to be worse, isn't it? It's back inside the Jaguar again. This is the uh, John Watson Henri Pescarolo car. Of course, as I was saying, one interrupted us self when we saw that car off. They've both got big backup because although there are only three works Porsches and there are five works control Jaguars, there are some very prominent and historically successful private teams running Porsches, noticeably the Reinhold Just cars number seven and eight with people like Didier Tays and David Hobbs, the Englishman who lives in America, and then John Winter, the German, Frank Jelinski, Stanley Dickens, those cars which are very, very prominent uh, in the history and have won this race so that Porsche have a big backup as the Kramer team as well, which we'll perhaps talk about again because that Toyota car of Tiffany Dell and his team is still in the sand. And Vern Chaban as well, um, who's got, among other drivers, uh, Another of the ex-Porsche drivers of long gone by, Brian Redmond driving his car now at 51 years old. Keeps he on retiring, but keeps on coming back. It's addictive, they can't give it up. And who started racing with a Morris Minor 1000. Now there's two Jaguars running together. Number three, the Pescarolo Boesel Watson car, the one with the camera in it. And number 21, the American one, Sullivan, Jones and Cobb. And I think, in fact, we are seeing a, an in-position on the road situation there with those two cars as a result, A, of pit stops, and B, as a result of the fact that we've had a couple of Porsches have their problems making their way up, as somebody else is being pushed into the pit road. That's the Primer Gaz Porsche by the look of it, and that's rather a pity because that car went very well last year, and they're not having a happy time this year. Now that's, uh, he stopped well off the edge of the pit road. Camera shots again, these terrific shots of the driver's eye view. And the number three car, of course, has Henri Pescarolo, the French driver who has made almost Le Mans his own over a number of years. The Americans look as if they'd like to pass him. Show the Americans is driving that now. He's being very competitive. And getting alongside, no, he's tucked himself in. He'll try and pick his place probably under braking or something like that rather than a straight line where they're going to be more evenly matched. Quite a, a little fight going on here, and the American cars, of course, are very, very anxious to go well. They're not having too happy a time in America, where the regulations are different. They don't run with a 7-litre engine, they run with a 6-litre engine, and currently they've got the uh, Nissans putting it across them in the hands of Jeff Brabham, son of Sir Jack Brabham, the eldest of the Brabham trio of boys racing. These, when you're just thinking for a minute of the aerodynamic marvels these cars are now the technological development compared with the jaguars that won here 21 years ago how different they look very different because of course those cars were open cars originally the fed in cockpit for the driver then they went to a full-length windscreen and it was that really that sounded the death knell of the open car however the d-type aerodynamically was very very good but those were the days before people bothered about lift the tendency of a car as it goes faster and faster to take off that's why you get the wing appendages and things like that, which put up cornering speeds, the wider tyres help as well. But that's where it's all changed round. That's the uh, number 19, the Andretti family Jaguar, leaving the pits again after another routine stop. Yes, of course, these racing cars, really, you can think of them as aeroplanes flying upside down. They're flying into the ground instead of above it. Yes, they've changed the bottom of uh, sports cars now. Last year they had a bit more ground effect than they have now, and you can see they can get a bit skittish, as number 18 did there, and we saw also that those Jaguars had changed round. But here's the number two car again. The lead Jaguar then, still right very much in the hunt with this race now wearing on a little bit. We've
got the first set of pit stops over, the second set of pit stops over. We've seen the early problems, and you see there, as the brakes went on, the steering wheel slack a little bit, because that means that the brakes are just getting not quite as true as they were at the start of the race. One of the advantages, if you can call it that, of the comparatively long time that the refueling has to take with the flow rate regulations, you've got time to change the brake pads when you need to without actually holding anything up. Uh, those two Jaguars are setting about each other with a vengeance. I don't know whether you noticed, Anthony, but they've swapped positions again. It yep. was the American car in front, now it's number three back in front again. And this is the Istel C2 car, uh, the car that's being driven by the current British saloon car champion, Chris Hodgetts. Uh, and that is limping in and looks as if it might have some sort of problem. One of the drivers in that team, John Sheldon, is an example of the addiction of this because he had the most horrifying accident here years ago and is still coming back for more. That's one of the Brun Porsches, another of the private teams. So that in for a scheduled stop, and as Anthony was saying, John Sheldon back in the race after a terrible accident with Aston Martin some years ago. Driller Sheldon, he's a dentist by profession, and has gone back to it, no problem at all. Number three Jaguar, savagely attacking number 18 Porsche. And that's the end of the Mulsanne again. And the Jaguars are applying pressure all the time, and this is working out as we rather thought it would. A battle between the works teams of Jaguar and Porsche, and everybody else, while not totally outdistanced, is certainly not able to maintain quite that pace. Of course, we regret the disappearance of the Mercedes, who had a tyre uh, explode and cause an accident uh, during the qualifying, and therefore decided that they couldn't take the risk of running, but they were off the pace. They weren't qualifying very quickly anyway. I think they had a, an aerodynamic and tyre-related problem. Yes, that happened to one of their German drivers, uh, Klaus Niedewitz, who more often than not partners Klaus Ludwig uh, when they're driving saloon cars together. Yes, it's a great shame. It would be lovely to have seen a three-way battle if they could have got their act together, as they have in the shorter races in this series this year with a vengeance. The Swiss Sauber team, officially supported by Mercedes, but they're not here. So we watch with great excitement those that are here, the great Jaguar and Porsche teams. That's a scheduled pit stop for another of the Toyotas, the Tiffany Dell car, in fact, that we saw in the sand, and they're getting the sand out of it. And this is the battle, I think, for the lead that's coming up towards us now. Two Porsches side by side. And that's the number 17 car that's trying to catch up ground. The number 18 car, which is now in front of the Jaguar, which, as you can see, is lurking behind only about 25 yards or so down, but it'll be significant to see whether the number 17 car, which has got to make up time, pulls away now from the leading car. He must have lost at least a lap with that misjudgment over fuel, if that's what it was. And, of course, the number one Jaguar lost a bit of time when Nielsen was stuck in the sand and pulled out by that glorious vintage machine. You will also have seen that the light is beginning now to draw in just a little bit because we've moved on a little in this 1988 Le Mans 24 hour race and the heat of the early afternoon is giving way to the early evening and here we see this movement again with a very very determined Porsche number 17 really paying no heed to uh, his uh, teammate at all. It's a question of make your own arrangements, and I reckon that's got to be Hans Stuck. Yes, I think it probably is, and I think they were overtaking one of the Brune Porsches, weren't they? Yep, three, nine, six, twos abreast. Yes, number five car. That's the Brun Porsche driven by Uber Schaefer, Jesus Perea, and Massimo Sigala. Chance to look at the speeds on the Molsan. Talking of speeds on the Molsan, the French take that perhaps more seriously nowadays than they take the race. They've got two cars which have done very little and that looks to me like one of them uh, but actually go out with the intention of recording the fastest speed down the Molsan straight which to me is not in the spirit of Le Mans, Anthony well no and I don't know that anybody really thinks it is but they will bathe quietly tonight and go home for an early bath and say we were the fastest down the straight yeah feel pleased about it rather a pity when you think of the late great challengers here at Le Mans of Renault of Matra and of course of Bugatti and Delahaye and Delage years ago. 
This race has alternated very much, really, between the nations, hasn't it? Oh, yes. I mean, going back to its very inception, the British were in from the word go, and it wasn't very much after that, of course, that the Germans joined in, and the Americans, too, with the uh, Black Horse Hawk Stutz and the Mercedes and things like this, which faced the tremendous effort of Bentley, and that was, of course, in the 20s, right up to 1930, their last win. But over the years, you've had, the, as you say, the Bentleys and the Jaguars and Aston Martins from England. You've had the Mercedes and the Porsches, particularly from Germany. You've had the Fords from America. And uh, you've had the Italian Ferraris and Alphas. It's been very much an international event for many, many years. Huge prestige, of course, always, and commercial result for the manufacturer that wins. And that is another works Porsche stop. Can't see which one it is from the back here. It looks like an Andretti one to me. That's various members of the Andretti family swapping places. That's number 19. It's an interesting uh, idea, in fact, driving with your son and your nephew. I think I wouldn't have any sleep at all if I was worried about driving with my son and my nephew. Well, it's something he's very, very much wanted to achieve as a family win. He said to me some years ago, after he'd won the World Championship, won in Annapolis, he'd won all the American Championships, he'd won so much, and I said to him, Mario, is there anything left, anything you really want to do before you pack it? He said, yes, I want to win Le Mans with my son. Can, well, he, do, can he do it this time? He's not all that pl well placed at the moment, but there's a long time yet. Oh, yes, and uh, they've driven their own race at their own pace. There is one, two, one. That's... Uh, Evan Clemens, Costas Loss, and Wayne Taylor in a C2 car, one of the spices. Very competitive field, that. It's mainly spices, but uh, works ones and private ones, but built by the spice company. But there are a lot of other contestants as well who give them a hard time if they have any trouble. In the context of the World Sports Prototype Championship, of course, Le Mans is different to any other race because most of those races are 1,000-kilometer races, and they last anything up to five and a half, six hours. Now, here we're talking about four times that distance, which is 24 hours. And, of course, as a result of that, you get double points if you win at Le Mans. But it is, by itself, perhaps the most important race in the championship and I would beg to differ with anybody who said that it wasn't perhaps the most important race in the world. There are a couple of three sprint events in the championship as well which tend to attract a lot of the German cars but uh, the big beauty of Le Mans is things like that fairground that we've just seen there which everybody goes and visits. It's, it's, it's a special day out Anthony isn't it? It's something yeah. like no other motor race. I think the fun fair and the frolic in the forest is part of it. A lot of people may not be tremendous racing enthusiasts but this is a happening if they are racing enthusiasts very often it pulls a bit the race settles down it this time doesn't look like doing it but very often it does but going back to what you were saying i think to win Le Mans is extremely important for a big manufacturer at jaguar last year 1987 they won the championship but they didn't win here and i think it's a tremendous challenge to them to win here again after 21 years the commercial payoff for a team that wins Le Mans, a manufacturer's team, is tremendous. And I'm sure they want that. They got a great deal out of winning the championship, but I think Le Mans is a very, very special thing to win. You can see now that night is falling. The lights are coming into their own slowly but surely. On the far side of the circuit out here, you've just got the lights of the cars. Then they come into this brightly lit pit area, flash through it, just like a flash, and this, of course, goes on all night. And a lot of the spectators, in fact, are staying to watch this battle. But now some of them move away into Le Mans itself to the hundreds of little catering sites around the circuit where you can get, in fact, some extremely good food, I should tell you. There is, of course, the normal hospitality now that goes on at large motor race meetings with most of the teams and many of the trade sponsors having hospitality units here, serving hundreds and thousands of meals to people and there's the fairground, as we've said. There's a church service even in the morning. The whole of Le Mans is geared. It's almost like a village that comes alive once every year for the 24 hours. And you see there, they've changed the nose cone on the front of that number 17 Porsche. I wonder whether he's been off somewhere. Well, we have just heard, in fact, that he did touch the back of another car, and that's the reason why. Uh, but you can see both lights are working where they weren't when he came into the pit. So that's the reason for that stop. It will have delayed him but little. And now we've got an infrared picture. This again is technology moving into the 
20th century, the latter half. This is what they see through infrared sights. But this is an infrared picture of a car going around Le Mans. We can actually pick up the car. We can't pick up the number. But it's quite a contrast with the normal sort of night shots that we have at Le Mans. And here's one of those as we've got coming into the pits. One of the Jaguars, number one, the Martin Brundle John Nielsen car. It looks as though Nielsen is about to take over from Brundle. So a change of driver for the number one Jaguar. This is the one driven by just two people. It's not leading the race. It's up there now. And, of course, if the Jaguars get into a fighting and a strong fighting position, they will tend to drive this race as something of a team race. It was the one that was really intended, I think, to win if all things were equal. Well, Anthony, you know, we've had nine hours of racing now because it's the witching hour, it's midnight, and it's still a ding-dong battle that's going really on the pit stops between Porsche and Jaguar. In the lead now, literally at midnight, number 18 Porsche, that's the Bob Wallach, the Cyril van der Merwe, Vern Schuppen car in second place, Jaguar number two, Andy Wallace, Jan Lammers, Johnny Dumfries in third place, Porsche number 17, who's come up from that delay that we saw, the Stuckbell Ludwig car, the one that went out of petrol, then number 21 Jaguar, the first of the American cars, Sullivan, Jones and Price Cobb, then number one Jaguar, that's the Brundle Nielsen car, that was the other one that was delayed. Then number 19, the Andretti's Porsche, the Andretti family. And number eight Porsche, the first of the non-works cars, one of the Yost Racing, the Blaupunkt Yost Racing cars. And then finally the next Jaguar, the number 22 Jaguar, the Silk Cut car. Sadly missing, the number three car, the Pescarello Raul Bazel John Watson car, that has stopped out on the circuit with what we are told is a transmission problem. But that's one Jaguar out, four Jaguars still in, still the three Porsches in. And one of the Jaguars in now, having more than, I would say, routine maintenance at this point. Yes, that looks like a problem. It's difficult to see exactly what they're doing. Of course, it is most unusual at Le Mans for what we used to call the Le Mans two-hour Grand Prix to go on so long. These cars are still racing mostly on the same lap, or give or take a pit stop or two, and they're locked in combat just like a Grand Prix, and, as you say, the race is nine hours old. It really is a, a, a tremendous um, fillet for both Jaguar and Porsche that this race should be going on, but particularly so for the spectators, all the British spectators that have come here, but a very rare thing indeed. And one tends to look back, perhaps, at the very early Le Mans. There's the Yost Porsche in, having uh, what looks to be some fairly uh, minor maintenance done on the car in this night section. But I would say we tend to look back, perhaps, at the, the electrics, the enormous reliance that people put now on the huge high capacity lights that they have during the course of the hours of darkness. This is one of the reasons why Le Mans was so popular in the 20s because it was responsible for the development of modern lighting that we see on cars today. Jaguar number two coming in. This is the leading Jaguar. It's not leading the race at this moment, but it's the leading Jaguar. The number two car, Lammers Dumfries Wallace. Now is it all well? Is it routine? Yes, that looks to be routine. You can see tucked down behind those huge plastic grills, another light, and that's the number seven Porsche, the used Porsche Didier Tay, uh, Franz Conrad, David Hobbs car, and that seems to be stationary a little bit longer than perhaps we'd have expected at this stage, because he was about to go out and then changed his mind. Now he's off now. But when the works team dropped out, the Joost Porsches upheld the mark and won the race. Well, it's 8 a.m. in the morning now, and the position has changed a little during the night. It's changed because one Porsche is out, number 18 Porsche, and the number 19 car has dropped back with an engine problem. But Jaguars currently are leading the race with the number two car, the pace setter, and then behind them, having made up for all that lost time, number 17 Porsche, that's the Derek Bell, Hans Tuck, Klaus Ludwig car is up to second place, and the number one Jaguar is up to third place as the tired spectators, some of them who have stayed by the trackside, not bothered to get up to go to those services we talked about, watch the number one car, the Martin Brandle, John Nielsen car, come past the pit area here, which is now beginning to fill up again. People coming back to the circuit. Windscreens you will see cleaned or are, in fact, using the metal there to stop the misting up on the inside. I thought we got a crack there because one of the Jaguars this morning did have a windscreen change. 
Yes, it did. And I tell you what, there's some problems in the Porsche team. The 18 cars went, as you say, and I think it was something to do with the cooling system. And the Andrettis have been very badly delayed. There's bits of car flying all over the place there. I don't know what that That's was. That's a Jaguar, and that, I think, was a tyre going on it. There's a ja Jaguar there that had a tyre go. So a dramatic moment for Jaguar, and we didn't see or were able to pick up then exactly which Jaguar that was. There's the number two car going through, the leading car, so it wasn't that. But one of the Jaguars has had a targo. It's the number one car. It's the number it's one It's Nielsen car. or Brundle. I think it's Nielsen coming in very slowly, as you say, with a blown tire. But the Porsches, the Andretti's, have got intercooling problems as well, and they've dropped back to about seventh or eighth places place. And I think Porsches are worried that this epidemic might attack their current front runner, number 17, which, of course, is the original Stuck Bell Ludwig car. Because, of course, Bell would love to bring this home and, e and, and equal Jackie X's all-time record. But meanwhile, the Jaguars are going strongly, although number 22 has the second of the American cars is way, way back. No, number 21, I correct. Number 21 is way, way back, down in 20 something place. They've had transmission problems, which are roughly similar to what uh, has been holding back the number one car on and off. Yes, the number 22 car, in fact, An Anthony, you were right there, it had been quite a long way back. It's been driven at a much slower pace, in fact, than the other Jaguars, but it is now beginning to make its presence felt. Jaguars have not had things all their own way, although they've been the most numerous of cars. The number 8 Porsche you see there, that's the Yoast car, that is in fourth place at the moment. Here's the number 17 Porsche, the leading Porsche uh, of the three that started. Now, in fact, one of them out, so two remaining comes in for a scheduled stop. There's the number eight car in fourth place. And the battle now, the endurance battle, because it's so rare to have, of course, in Le Mans, when you often get a lead of 70, 80, 100 miles. The car's so close together, there's no more than the odd pit stop in it. This is going to go down as one of the great Le Mans in history. Whoever wins this night-long and now day-long battle between the two teams, now Porsche depending entirely on the number 17 car, backed up by that number 8 Reinhold Joost private team car. The Jaguars with their numbers 2 and 1 at the moment in front. The 22s hang in thereabouts in fifth place. As I say, 21, the other American one dropped way back. The Andretti's in trouble. Number three's gone. Now number one's in trouble with that tyre. So really, I think it's down to number two Jaguar and 17 Porsche, probably, to fight this thing out. And as you will see from your picture, it's no longer quite as bright as it was yesterday when we started this race. And there is a threat all the time that we may have that one thing that Hans Stuck is waiting for, and that is rain. The rain master Stuck in the rain is something I think we'd all love to see. We've been told all the way through this weekend that it's going to rain. It didn't rain through the night, which is what really makes things most difficult for people. Now is it going to get through the whole race without rain? Well, Le Mans without rain is a pretty rare thing. You can see around the circuit there, there are cars littered about a little bit, but the basic reliability record of all the cars in this 1988 Le Mans 24-hour race has been pretty good. By any account, we've got a lot of cars left in, a lot of competitive cars left in, but never, ever, for a very long time, going back now perhaps to the 60s, I think, that famous race between Porsche and Ford, if we had cars so close together, and there's the leading Jaguar, the number two car, the car we saw start off making the pace for Jaguar. That's remarkable, you know, that car yes, still be here. That car's been the front runner for Jaguars all the way through the race. It's been in the lead for many, many laps on the board, and this looks like trouble. This looks like the number one car, I think, is it? Yes, it's the number one car, Anthony. That looks very much to me like a cracked cylinder head, the big V12 cylinder head. If that goes, you've got a problem, and they've got one. I'm afraid they have. We're still, as I say, dependent on this car for Jaguar and the number 17 car for Porsche. I think other people are in trouble of one kind and another. And, uh, of course, as we keep saying, the Reinhold Joost car number 8 is still there joining the Porsche team in the defence of Le Mans. Well, that car is moving up now to third place because we now have confirmation that number one Jaguar has got a big problem. It is a cylinder head gasket that has gone. The cylinder head is cracked. It's out of the race, and here's the rain. The rain, as we feared, might happen, and this could change the whole thing around all over again. Well, of course, this puts us into tyre change tactics. It's very, very important not 
to give in too soon in case it's only a shower. When I say give in, I mean come in, put on the treaded rain tyres, which of course means you lap slower. It won't last very long if it dries out. On the other hand, not to stay out too long and get the car unmanageable on the racing slick tyres. The number two leading Jaguar there. Now, what are they going to do? How long are they going to put up with the rain on these tyres? There are, of course, intermediate tyres. There's a sort of damp track tyre as well. But again, if it dries out, it limits your speed and you'd have to stop again to change them. The number 17 Porsche there, the Stuck Bell car fighting its way, trying to stave off this Jaguar challenge. And you can see the tail of the car weaving there as they tried to put the power down on the wheel spin, and it now is very slippery in places. Funnily enough, as is often the case with a long circuit like this, you've got more rain in some places than in others, so it goes from varying conditions of being slippery, very slippery, and not so slippery. Now here's the Jaguar in. They've changed the driver. Which car is that? Because that might be the lead car going on to wet or intermediate tyres, which would be very important tactically. Well, tactically it will be, but also tactically from Porsche's point of view, this is when they will want Hans Stuck out, because it's at this stage of the race, there's the number 22 Jaguar, incidentally, that Stuck, the acknowledged rain master, will come into his own. Yes, it's extraordinary how some drivers have this great genius on a wet track. There is those two cars together, the number 17 Porsche, the number 22 Jaguar. They're not actually on the same lap, they're not together in order. Jaguar number two leads. Jaguar number two leaves this 1988 Le Mans 24 RS. Andy Wallace, Johnny Dumfries, Jan Lammers lead from the Stuck, Bell, Klaus Ludwig, Porsche number 17, and there's only seconds between them. Then it's back to Car number eight, one of the private Porsches, the Blaupunkt cars uh, of the Ghost Racing. Number 22 Jaguar in fourth place. One of the drivers there, the Australian Larry Perkins. Then number seven Porsche, one of the drivers there, Britain's David Hobbs. And back then to number 19, the Andretti's Porsche, the other surviving works car, the one that's running on five cylinders, not six. But you can see on the grass there, that is Stuck on the grass, on dry tyres, struggling hard to stay out there on a damp and slippery track and to catch up with the Jaguar challenge. And there are seconds between them. I think it's going to be who makes the right decision about tyres gambling on what the weather's going to do. That's going to be a big advantage in this race if one or other of them makes a dif different decision. And astonishingly enough, Stuck is going on past. Yes, That's amazing after he's found how difficult it is. You know, we talk about uh, Grand Prix drivers and the difference between Grand Prix drivers and long-distance drivers, but that difference is getting less and less. There are so many drivers here who are current Grand Prix drivers, just ex-Grand Prix drivers, like Brundle, who's taken a year off, Wallace, uh, who is obviously going towards Grand Prix racing, Dumfries, who could quite easily do so, Lammers, who has. Uh, it's now no longer the province of, shall we say, a driver who's not got quite the pace and stuck. Well, let's face it, if he was a smaller man, he'd fit in a Grand Prix car, but because he's six foot plus tall, to fit him in a current Grand Prix car, virtually impossible. Now, there's the leader, still the spray. I think the rain's easing off a bit. The Reinhold Joost Porsche, number eight now, a uh, fourth place car, a third place car, I think, now, in the pits. Now, they, what sort of tyres are they putting on? Can we see, or is that man going to stand in the way? He's going to stand in the way. So I don't know whether they put dry weather tyres back on again or not. There's the leader, the race leader, that car which has led so many laps and so many hours of this race, that number two Jaguar. We talked about it being the hair sent out to break the others and perhaps get broken, but in fact, two of the other Jaguars have fallen by the wayside. One of the Porsches and another one's in trouble, so it's that car which has been fighting for the lead all the way, that number two and the number 17 Porsche, they're still fighting it out. And we're looking at the Porsche, the one that had that tremendous moment that we saw a few minutes ago, and now at the Jaguar, and it's between these two cars that we have had this battle going on race long. Track dried out now. Spray's gone. We're over three quarters distance in this 1988 Le Mans 24-hour race, and it was in 1957 that Jaguar won this race last. Prior to that, 56, then 55, they finished second in 54, they won again in 53, they all retired in 52 and won for the very first time in 1951. But Porsche, well, their record is the one of win after win that they're defending at the moment. Yes, and of course they're only racing in Le Mans at the this year's series, this year's championship. The Works Porsche team have come out of a hibernation just for Le Mans. 
whereas the Jaguars, of course, are doing the whole series, and uh, the Reinhold Joost team and on and off the Kramer team are doing most of the races. Yes, the Porsche made its debut at Le Mans. Those days they were called the 956, but there's not a great deal of difference. Uh, the basic design is the same, and they have won Le Mans every year since that car first entered. And this looks as if it might be the time when they might be beaten by a British car that hasn't won this race for 31 years. And that, I think, is the Andretti car, ahead, although several laps behind, of the leading car, the leading car in the race number two, Jaguar. And we're getting, we're getting a situation now where you notice, Neville, every time the Jaguar has a pit stop, the number 17 Porsche begins to catch up a bit. And then, of course, he has his pit stop and the Jaguar pulls away. Yes, they're keeping that gap, and the gap after nearly 24 hours is still this amazing minute, minute and a half, something like that. It, it's quite unbelievable, a historic Le Mans race. It says a tremendous amount for the concentration and strength of the drivers and, of course, for the quality of the cars, that they can stand this high-speed challenge all the way through because it's not usual at the moment, it's not what anybody expects. Usually, at some stage, somebody's way, way ahead, somebody's dropped back, and you can back off and ease off just a little. But they've been racing right up against the limit. It's interesting also, so far, we haven't seen any sign of them having to back off because of fuel shortage. No, the fuel situation, in fact, we've been peeping when we had a chance to get down into the pits to see how things are going there. And you can see there, as the Jaguar reels off, these final laps of the race, the excitement as he comes into the pits for the last time. And this is the important pit stop as far as Jaguar are concerned. Change of wheels, they're inspecting the brake pads. Here a race can be won or lost at this stage in the pits, and they'll give this car a really good check over before it goes out with mounting excitement now here at Le Mans, with Jaguar well set for a historic victory. But before they can win that victory, they've got to survive the last hour, Anthony, and that alone has brought its problems in the past. Well, this, of course, is where the tension mounts for everybody. All the Jaguar fans all around the track who want them to win, the drivers who worked so hard, the mechanics and the team who've worked so hard, and everything in that car has been used to the ultimate all the way through now for nearly 24 hours. And it must be showing the strain. A couple of its teammates have gone out with troubles, and this is, as you say, its last planned routine pit stop. Let's hope it is the last pit stop, because if it stops again, that'll mean a problem. And the same token, the Porsche team are worried about that car. As we said before, the other two cars had intercooling problems, cooling system problems, and they're worried about the integrity of the number 17 car's system. So. And this car has not had any problems, except for a screen change, I believe, in the middle of the night. So, in a sense, its track record literally is better than the other one, but that doesn't mean that the excitement's over, because it isn't. And seldom have we had a Le Mans where the excitement's kept up to so near the end. Yes, I asked Tom Walkinshaw when he started preparing for this race, and he said immediately after the last one, and indeed... There is hours and hours of preparation, of meetings, of looking at every single component in the car to make quite sure that it will last the 24 hours. And while they're doing that, and racing, of course, in the championship, as you've said, Porsche have had a whole year to concentrate on this race and this race alone. And they've obviously spent a lot of time on preparing these cars with now just one hour to go. And that's going to be one of the most nervous hours that anybody could ever expect to have to put up with at Le Mans. Well, it is, because if anybody has a problem now, it will be too late to make it up. It looks as though they're both able to run pretty competitively still at this late stage on their fuel allowance, so the fuel battle seems to have come out even. Yes, it only wants a puncture, though, or something like that, something comparatively minor. And we had one of those on a Jaguar, didn't we? Or he hit something or shredded a tower on some wreckage or something. There's the leading car, the Jaguar number two, leading the race. And so often Le Mans has finished up, as we've said, with a huge distance between the cars, or a very sick car limping across the line. Lagonda won it but once, and the bearings had gone on the car, and they nursed it across the line. There was the heartbreak of Pierre Levesque in 1952, when he was so tired. In those days, drivers used to go right the way through the 24 hours without a change, and he made the change in the gearbox, because he changed from third to second instead of third to fourth and blew the engine sky high. And all those things can happen in this last hour, this wearying hour at Le Mans, when the nerves, the tempers, and everything else begin to fray. Of course, we were talking about the 1987 Le Mans, which 
Jaguar didn't win, although they won the championship, but we mustn't forget that they did actually run in 86. And uh, Tom Walkinshaw has been quoted as saying it would take him three years to make sure of it. Is this going to be the third year? Well, it is the third year, but is he going to prove the point? First and fourth places for Jaguar. It was, of course, in 1957 that they finished first, second, fourth, I think fifth and sixth or something like that. So they haven't done quite as well as they did then, but don't forget they've had but two cars of the five retired. There are three Jaguars still running. The number 22 car considerably back in the field. I think he's about eighth or ninth position at the moment. In fourth place, the uh, other car, the other Jaguar, I think I might have got those the other way around. It's 22 that is in fact in, in fourth place, and it's 21 that's run further back, is it? Oh, way further back, yes, way down in the teen places, uh, number 21, that's Sullivan, Jones and Cobb, but Kogan, Daly, Perkins, yes, they're running fourth. They are in fact sandwiched between the two Reinhold Port, Reinhold Jost Porsches, numbers eight and seven, which are third and fifth. Disappointingly for the Andrettis, they are sixth after their cooling problems, so Mario's got to try all over again if he really wants to win the race with his son. But up front, that car there, number two, leads the Le Mans race for 1988, ahead of the number 17 Porsche of the great Le Mans experts, Stuck, Bell and Ludwig. You could hardly have a hotter Le Mans team than that lot. No, on, on paper, they've got all the experience, and if you look at Dumfries, or you look, for that matter, at Andy Wallace, they haven't really got the experience of Le Mans. You mustn't count your cats before the kittens are hatched, or whatever you say, but if they win, what a great thing for those two drivers, particularly, I mean, Jan Lammers hasn't won Le Mans either, but he has won a lot of races. Those two, Dumfries and Wallace, at the beginning end of their careers, what a great thing for them. Well, it's very important, in fact, I think, for Wallace, who's about to make his move into 3,000. Here comes the Jaguar number two in the pits. And this must be just a final top-up, unless it's a problem. Yeah, final top-up. And the final decision as to who will drive that last heart-stopping hour. Yes, who's going to have the A, honour, B, burden of responsibility of bringing it in? I think it'll probably be Jan Lammers. He started the car, and I suspect he'll finish the car. Certainly the most experienced, the senior member of that group, that team. Meanwhile, the Porsche goes on its way, catching up, catching up all the time, the Jags in the pits, which wasn't long, just a final top-up, not a full pit stop, maybe not much more than a driver change to put Lammers back in the car. So that comes number two, and you can hear the cheer of the crowd there, the huge, massive crowd that have come back, those people who have travelled back during the course of the morning. Some stayed in hotels, some stayed late in the cars. It's all part of this wonderful atmosphere of Le Mans. And the beautiful part about it is, of course, the traffic of Le Mans all disposes of itself as the Jaguars now are beginning to collect themselves together for a team-type finish. What, how great it would be if they managed, if they had the spare time, as it were, in hand over the Porsche, to line themselves up for a three-car finish, because there are three still going. As we know, number 21 Jaguar is well back in the field, but if they could somehow get themselves into line, the radio control and one thing and another, and come over the line together, how great that would be. But there's still time for things to go wrong before that happens. While I'm looking, we've got two of them running together now. The first and fourth place car, the fourth place car. Uh, interesting in that it has among its drivers Larry Perkins, the Australian driver, who is representing TWR in his other hat because they are busily preparing not only to race with Jaguars, but also with Holden's, the Australian car, again part of TWR's. You can hear the cheers of the crowd and the waves of the flags as they come past the pits, and this is happening every lap. They're cheering them on towards victory. The atmosphere's building up now. This is building to be the, fi the finish of a very fine Grand Prix. About 12 minutes to go only, about 12 minutes to go. You've got two of the Jaguars in line. Unless something goes wrong, the Porsche can't possibly catch them now. He's just got too much of a deficit. He kept getting off the lap when he stopped at the pits, and then the Jaguar stopped, and he got back on the lap, but he couldn't make it up. So if this number two car keeps rolling as it is now, it's going to win. And it's got its number 22 teammate in fourth place behind it, the number 21 car, much further back, but three Jaguars still going. Uh, the question is whether they now can find the other one and get it lined up for a three-car finish. Yes, it's a question, really, of surviving this last, what, three laps or so, something like that, because one problem, it's still only seconds, and it's a real 
Oh, I don't know. The curl the toes, the fingers, the lot. A jittery moment for everybody here. We're waiting to see whether or not this historic win can happen at Le Mans. And cars have run out of fuel in the last stages before now. I think he's going to win. I think he's going to do it. But we mustn't be too optimistic. You can so easily talk yourself into a state of joy, which is then taken from you. Two Jaguars running together, nose and tail. I don't know whether they'll actually manage to find the third one on the road in these final stages, Great or is that it behind? Great fun if they did. I think that might be the car behind, in fact, Anthony. I think you'll find that the three Jaguars have lined up. So it shows that whatever was the wrong with the uh, American Jaguar that slowed, it's caught up again. It's going as well as ever. And all three cars now sounding healthy, sounding, in fact, very little different to when they started the race, have lined themselves up as we come into the last two laps of this 1988 Le Mans and it looks as if Jaguar and Tom Walkinshaw have been able to keep that promise that they made when they first competed three years ago. But they've got them together in first, fourth and sixteenth places, numbers 2, 22 and 21. Dine ahead the English section of the crowd at least, which is a very large section, going absolutely raving spare now with excitement. It's what they came to see, what they hoped to see last year, and they didn't. Well, Jaguar are not going to be the, the disappointing factor now at Le Mans. They're all waving the flags. Look at the marshals waving all the flags as they come round to the finish. This is a race, incidentally, which stops right at the finish. There's no question of cooling off flags, so if a crowd simply swarm all over the track as soon as the checkered flag comes up. They, if they miss a lap, if they miss going over before 3 o'clock, they have to go round again. And the marshals know, the crowd know, the drivers must know, it's just minutes to go now before the end of the 1988 Le Mans 24-hour race and Jaguars in line-ahead formation are making their way down the Mulsanne Strait for what will probably be the last time in this historic effort towards victory for 1988. They would certainly want to make it the last time. They wouldn't want, as I say, to cross over the line, say, at one minute or 40 seconds before 3 o'clock, then they have to go all the way around again and the risk of things going wrong again. Marshals out there waving vigorously to the three Jaguar drivers. Jaguar, a very popular name, of course, at Le Mans, and it's been a long time since they gave their supporters this success. They're the pit signaling at Mulsanne. Champagne already in the pit signaling area. Well, they've decided that Jaguar have won. The crowd have decided that Jaguar have won. And I think even now, Sir John Egan, who's been here to watch this race, to provide encouragement for the team throughout, has decided that at last this victory has come true for him, for Tom Walkinshaw, and all the team who have been competing here at Le Mans. It looks as if they've done the job. And, of course, there's a big, big party of Jaguar guests here who have come to see justice. There's the second-place car. Don't forget that the number 17 Porsche of Stuck, Bell and Ludwig is still in second place and uncatchable. And in third place is the Reinhold Just Porsche, number 8, of Winter, Yelinski and Dickens, so that although Jaguars have won, Porsches have got second and third. Yes, by no means a walkover for Jaguar, but I don't think they would have wanted it any other way, would they, Anthony? No, you don't want to... If, it, if you do that, it looks too easy. This has been hard, very difficult to do, and they've done it, and that's very important. The helicopter shot overhead as we look down, going to a camera. Oh. Still fairly high up, watching the cars, watching the marshals as they come round. And is this going to be it? Is this going to be the last lap of the 1988 Le Mans 24-hour race? It looks to me as if they might be a little bit premature, but we'll have to wait and see. All the flags are going. The crowd is surging forward. They've climbed what appeared to me to be impregnable barriers to get across the road. And it's only when we come into the pit area here that we'll see whether or not that massive crowd are going to mean that this is the last lap of Le Mans as the Jaguars come into There's the pit area. Flag. Checkered flag, they've done it. Jaguars have won the 1988 Le Mans 24-hour race, which they set out to do.
and they've brought great joy to the huge British contingent in this vast crowd. Many, many people have come over. We're told 50,000 British spectators here amongst the enormous crowd of French spectators and German and Italians and everyone else, a lot of American people here too. But I think it's fair to say this is a win for the Brits and they're going to enjoy it. They're flooding the track. The cars, of course, have to be stopped. Nobody can go round again. The cars coming in behind the Jaguars have got to be stopped so they don't rush into the crowd. But it's a great achievement and will bring great prestige to the name of Jaguar. They tried the last two years, but they didn't make it. This time they've done it. And that number two car, Lammers, Dumfries and Wallace, has led far and away the majority of the laps of the race this year. We saw our last shot of the straight there. That'll soon be public road again, as many of the roads of the Le Mans circuit are. And the French, of course, I think, delighted at a British victory. Uh, it's always been a little bit of entente cordiale here, and if uh, they can't win themselves, I think they'd as soon as see the British win as anybody, because it has been years of Porsche domination, but a marvellous drive by this car with, of course, Derek Bell, Klausdenbeck, Hanstock, putting up a tremendous battle. This was no walkover victory here at Le Mans in 1988 for Jaguar. It was against Porsche, who had devoted the whole of a year to preparing for this race. And now the question is, with 1988 won and in the bag, can they come back and do it again at Le Mans? Because for all the Jaguar fans, for the fans of the world prototype sports racing, this is important that we have all these marks. There you see the winning drivers, Jan Lammers nearest the camera, Johnny Dumfries in the middle. On the far side there, Andy Wallace, absolutely delighted with victory. Andy Wallace, it's his first major win. Benoit Froger, the public relations and press officer here for the Automobile Club de West, is handing the drivers hats, and they will no doubt throw them down to the crowd, Anthony. Yes, well, this is a great tradition, of course. They're supposed to wear these hats because... Uh, the tire manufacturer would like them to, but they are a gift to the first chap who manages to catch them. Oh, John, uh, Jan Lammers is wearing his. They've seen it together through the day and the night, and now it's their turn to celebrate, and they're fully entitled to it. And so are the mechanics, the engineers, the team chiefs, Tom Walkinshaw and his outfit who brought this to Jaguar. And there's the champagne. The champagne at the end of this race, and... Nobody's going to mind too much getting wet from that bottle of champagne that's being shaken. Let's just watch the cork, see when it goes. You can see the huge crowd below here who have come to celebrate this victory. There have been Jaguar flags, Jaguar umbrellas. The French, in fact, have really made their mark here by all the advertisements that you see in and around and on the way to the circuit have all been pictures of the Jaguars. And there's the champagne flowing. And that lady the girl there with Johnny Dumfries is his wife and she has been here to watch the race there is Tom Walkinshaw the man who put the team together the Scotsman winner himself of the European Touring Car Championship he's going to compete in it again later on this year but Tom delighted with the result here of Le Mans this last look then at the victorious Jaguars on what has become a historic occasion. Le Mans 1988 will go down in history as being the time when Jaguars came back and won. For me, it's been a magnificent opportunity to see perhaps one of my ambitions to see Jaguars win here at Le Mans come to fruition. And for you, Anthony, with a long experience of motor racing, it must bring a lump to your throat as well. Indeed it does, as the national anthem rings out to celebrate the victory of these three great drivers and a great team. Sir John Egan there enjoying the results of what he has put together with Tom Walkinshaw. And so it's time now for my colleague Anthony Marsh and I, Neville Hay, to leave Le Mans for another year. We have seen this historic Jaguar victory. We shall be back again to see if they can do it in 1989. <laughs>